Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our Facebook Live, and today's Tuesday. I'm running about 20 minutes late. I apologize to everybody. Pancreatic Cancer Conference, which occurs 11 o'clock, usually takes about an hour, hour and 10 minutes, and I'm back here about plenty of time, but today we had like a record number of cases, all extremely complicated, and so I just got back. So I apologize, and let's get started. So um, I was going to speak about liver tumors on CT, and let me just um, talk a little bit about several different things. So in terms of liver lesions, when you think about liver masses, the most common liver lesion is going to be benign, right? And probably the single most common lesion across the age spectrum, particularly in older patients, is going to be a liver cyst, right? Well-defined water density, single or multiple, ranging from a few millimeters to 20 centimeters. They're asymptomatic, nothing to do about them. One of the challenges with liver cysts, perhaps, is when they're very small, it's hard to say exactly what they are. You kind of know, um, you don't want to say too small to classify, but reality is sometimes they are. That is a challenge. And the second most common uh, benign lesion is hemangioma. And there, a non-contrast can look almost like a cyst, but it's usually higher density. But probably 90% of hemangiomas have a very classic appearance. More common in females, more common in right lobe of liver, can be single, can be multiple, can range from a centimeter to 20 centimeters. Most are under 5 cm. And the thing about hemangiomas is when you look at them over time, they have a certain enhancement pattern. They have peripheral puddling around the lesion, best seen probably at about 60 or 70 seconds. And with time, the puddling increases then the lesion starts to fill in from a peripheral to central pattern and then might be gone by five minutes or so, or maybe 10 minutes. Not every one of the lesions will become isodense. Some are a bit hyperdense, but homogeneous. But sometimes they have central scars. And so we used to talk about scars being something that was focal nodular hyperplasia, but scars can be seen in almost any lesion from cholangio to epitoma to FNH to hepatic adenoma the hemangioma. Mike Federley, uh, you know, in the old days, uh, when we're looking at hemangiomas, and I'll come back to Mike in a moment, it used to be that the lesion had to fill in its entirety. We used to follow the lesions for 30 minutes till they filled in. The reality is almost every lesion from hepatoma to, hem to hemangioma to metastasis, particularly vascular mets, can fill in. So filling in is not really a great criteria per se, but it's that peripheral puddling to central. Now you can say, gee, metastatic lesions often have peripheral vascularity, but peripheral vascularity is not the same thing. Rim enhancement is not the same thing as the puddling. And you look at CTSS in the teaching file, or look at some of the lectures I've given on liver tumors, you'll see uh, really nice examples of that. So that's typically not going to be a problem. Now, one of the challenges with hemangiomas is, is they don't always have the peripheral puddling. And interestingly, the larger the lesion, the uh, easier to see puddling often. We talk about lesions over 5 cm as giant hemangiomas, but again, most of them are under 5 cm. The challenge is often are these one centimeter lesions where they're in oncology patients, and since they don't behave perfectly, you can't, you can't really say this is definitely hemangioma, though in your heart you probably think it is, but how do you know it's not a metastasis? So that's something Maybe let me address that now. Uh, there's a good white paper. Rich Gore is the first author from the ACR on incidental uh, hepatic lesions. And, and the article makes the point that you have to treat them based on size, but also based on history. As an incidental finding, the patient with no known malignancy, no fever, it's going to be a cyst or a, a typical hemangioma. That's typically not going to be an issue. But that oncology patient, what do you do if it makes a difference between operating or not operating? So today, we saw a patient with an indeterminate lesion. I have a feeling it's, it's a flow-related lesion related to the patients having had stents. But if that lesion's metastasis, typically people will not operate. If the lesion is benign, then the patient could be a surgical candidate. Now, I will admit surgical thoughts are changing, even in pancreas, that with one single uh, or two or even three solitary well-defined liver meds, the surgeons will in fact be willing to operate if they feel they can have negative margins at the surgical bed. People are now rethinking pancreatic cancer, perhaps more to the colon cancer model that you will resect. 
the cure of several solitary lesions. But the question is, what category do you put the patient? If it's METS, it typically makes a big difference. Also in telling the patient what their outcomes are going to be, it's far worse when you have liver METS than without liver metastasis. So what do you do? Well, you could biopsy a lesion, but that works great if you have a positive biopsy, but if a negative biopsy, you kind of say, well, it's probably nothing, but how do you know? Maybe it's just a bad biopsy. Biopsies are at best 70% accurate, particularly for smaller lesions. You can do a PET scan, okay? Uh, size becomes an issue. Smaller lesions may not work well on PET. And also you need to have PET AVID. So in pancreatic cancer, 25% of pancreatic adenocarcinomas are not PET AVID. So the fact that lesion in the liver is negative doesn't mean anything. Maybe it's just not PET AVID. MRI seems to work very well. MRI uh, is a good study. It can recognize some angioma cysts and can be a bit more specific, particularly with uh, lesions, which you think maybe are just simply flow-related. It's very good for focal fat. It's very good for determining flow relation relations rather than tumors. So I think MR can be very valuable, very, very valuable in that regard. So if it makes a difference, go to a second study, and MR is a good study to go to. I think PET is just probably overkill, or not so much overkill as it probably will not answer the questions with the same accuracy. So I think that works out very nicely. Now, in terms of liver lesions, there's a, if you look at CTSS Facebook, which is where you are now, a couple of days ago I started posting the pearl of the day relates to liver lesions, and specifically vascular liver lesions, and you'll see this for about another week or so. And I discussed, there was a really good article published uh, recently about vascular liver lesions, differential diagnosis. So again, you think about hemangioma, I mentioned partly, we talk about focal nodular hyperplasia, benign lesion, more common in women, usually hyperdense, hypervascular on early phase imaging, but it's not as bright as the aorta, which, which is what you see typically with metastatic neuroendocrine tumors, often has a central scar, often homogeneous, and it's important to recognize they're often multiple, though one lesion is typically dominant, and the patient does not have underlying cirrhosis, and the thing about those lesions, they're vascular, central scar, and you can often see a feeding vessel go right to the center of the lesion. On venous phase, or surely delayed phase of three or four minutes, the lesion becomes isodense in most cases, then you may see the scar. Now the scar is something interesting, it has a feeding vessel. I mentioned that we used to think that scars in center of lesions were classic for FNH. I wrote that article myself a thousand years ago. But really, that's not the case. Uh, we said hemangiomas can have central scars, FNHs, epitomas, metastasis. So in a sense, it's not going to be all that specific, but it's something that's helpful. And if you look at a FNH, it just looks so beautiful compared to the IVC. It's the same brightness as the IVC, but not as bright as the aorta. Now, when I speak about FNH, the next thing I always talk about is hepatic adenomas. We used to talk about hepatic adenomas as benign lesions, and the big problem was that they spontaneously bled. Now, there's a lot of work being done in differentiating five categories of hepatic adenomas, some more likely to bleed, but more importantly, some more likely to become malignant. The challenge with hepatic adenomas from an imaging perspective is often that you can't tell the difference between hepatic adenomas and hepatoma. It can look identical, can look very aggressive. And the truth also is if you have a solitary hepatic adenoma or even a couple, surgeons will remove them because of A, the propensity for bleeding and propensity to develop into hepatoma. So that spectrum of hepatoma to hepatic adenoma is a very real one. And so it probably doesn't matter that much that you can say it's not a hepatoma, it's definitely hepatic adenoma. Maybe it helps in terms of the workup or the likelihood that the patient will do well, but it can be very challenging. Uh, now, in terms of bleeding, let me just touch on bleeding. We always say that if a lesion bleeds spontaneously, that means no trauma, no biopsy, it's hepatic adenoma for proven otherwise. Now, what else can bleed? Hepatoma can bleed. Uh, people used to write in the Japanese literature that 25% 25% of hepatomas presented with spontaneous bleeding. Now, I think that's just way off, and we see a small number of cases with bleeding in 
the number of cases I've seen of spontaneous hepatic bleed is very, very small from any cause. But think hepatic adenoma, most common to me is hepatic adenoma will prove more. Otherwise, it could be hepatoma. I've also seen a case of metastasis from neuroendocrine tumor bleed. I've seen lymphoma spontaneously bleed. I've seen patients who took uh, uh, toxins that have bled. You know, you drank uh, some of the uh, things you find under the kitchen sink. We've seen hemorrhage in that regard. But again, hepatic adenoma, <clears throat> proven otherwise. You can occasionally see reports of hemangioma that have bled, but in my experience, hemangiomas only bleed if you uh, biopsy them, so that becomes an issue. And then, of course, when we talk about um, malignancies are going from that hepatic adenoma over, hepatoma, typically hypervascular, significant neovascularity, large or small, multiple satellite lesions. When the lesions get larger, there's more necrosis present. But again, very prominent vessels with a hepatoma uh, become a very classic thing. We also talk about cholangiocarcinomas. They're vascular, but typically it's the periphery of the lesion that's very vascular, not so much the center. Hepatoma is the whole lesion is vascular. It could be necrosis and calcifications. Particularly with fibrolabella hepatoma, then you just see some vascularity, though not the extent, but you're more likely to see calcifications. Um, in terms of vascular lesions, also really, really super bright lesions, I think about neuroendocrine tumors. Metastatic pancreatic cancer from a neuroendocrine tumor, very, very vascular in the liver. Um, one differential between, let's say, a hepatoma and cholangio is that although hepatomas and cholangios can be multifocal, the more commonly one dominant mass, metastatic neuroendocrine tumors often multiple hypervascular masses uh, locally or throughout the liver. Also, you'll see the primary tumor typically in the pancreas or peripancreatic region or retroperitoneum or the chest, wherever we find neuroendocrine tumors. But neuroendocrine tumors in general give very vascular primary tumors, but also very valuable or very vascular distant metastasis. And that's particularly going to be true with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Just an incredible amount of vascularity and neovascularity. So it can allow you to make a very specific diagnosis. CT is used as a guide for embolization, particularly some of these vascular tumors that can be causing clinical symptoms. Now, we're almost finished with this talk, so I see a lot of people have given us the thumbs up. But if anyone has any specific questions, this might be the time to ask those questions. Um, in terms of vascular lesions, what else can you see? Uh, we used to talk about peliosis hepatitis as a uh, cause of vascular lesions. That was a lesion that was associated with AIDS. Very vascular lesion, it looked like a tumor spontaneously bled. As I mentioned, hemangioma is peripheral versus filling in, but we can see particularly small hemangiomas. People talk about the, the flash filling of a vascular lesion as hemangioma. Again, non serotic liver, small, typically one, maybe two cm. So we do see flash filling hemangiomas, which may not even have the classic peripheral enhancement. They just bright right away. So that is a possibility. Other vascular lesions, I've seen hepatic artery aneurysms, particularly when they're intrahepatic, be called vascular tumors or vascular metastasis or vascular primaries. And they're simply only actually hepatic artery aneurysms or pseudoaneurysms. So it's something you do need to be aware of. Uh, AV shunting, you can see what looks like vascular masses in patients with HHT disease, but there the vascularity, the prominent AV shunting is throughout the entire liver. So I don't really think you're going to make the mistake. I have seen patients with prior stab wounds or trauma, AV fistulae, so you can see that as well. And occasionally that can simulate a tumor, though I believe that's going to be far less frequent. Now, one thing I should mention, of course, Everything I've told you is dependent on technique. When we want to look at the liver, 100 to 120 cc's of Omni 350 or Visipec 320, injected ideally at five cc's a second, no less than four, and that becomes very important. Fast injections, fast delivery of iodine, fast scanning gives the lesion its characteristics. It allows you to see the vascularity. 
if you're doing some really sucky injection of one to two cc's a second, of 100 cc's of some godforsaken contrast material, uh, hopefully you'll even see the lesion, but you just have no characterization. When we look at outside scans, or not from your hospital, from everybody else's hospital, often one of the problems is the quality is poor, and it relates to the speed of injection, the timing of the acquisition, and the presentation of the data. And so if you really want to be good at recognizing, defining, and characterizing liver lesions, everything starts with the protocol. Fast injections, reasonable volume of contrast, well-timed acquisition. So 5 cc's, of a, 5 cc's per second, 100 to 120 cc's of contrast, depending on patient size and weight, and then a time study at arterial phase, roughly 30 seconds, and venous phase at about 65 seconds. You do that, you're going to be in business, you're going to do a great job. So we got 16 minutes, we started late, but we finished equally late, you know, but if you start late, you finish late. Okay, never mind. Anyway, I thank everybody for their attention. I don't see any questions, so I can't answer any questions. If you think of anything great, you can email us or Facebook us, and we'll see you when uh, next time around. Okay, have a great week.